Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me on the phone, Sharon? Make sure it actually sounds like decent audio. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello. It's muted.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to West Lafayette Christian. It is such a blessing to see you all here this morning. And please forgive us. This is our actual live stream, and uh, we didn't have audio for the video there, so I apologize for that. But welcome back. That was the whole point, and uh, it's just such a blessing to see you. In the time that we've been away, um, I had uh, mentioned a challenge about David in First and Second Samuel and also in the Psalms that correspond to that period of time. And I wanted to skip forward to First Chronicles 16:34 through 36, where David had just uh, completed the task of bringing the ark back into the city of Jerusalem, and he was uh, throwing quite the celebration, and uh, things were going very well for him there. But one of the things that, that this kind of made me think of was the promises of God that David relied upon. The three things that I um, try to stand on very, very firmly in my life are God's promises, God's provision, and the fact that he gives us a choice. And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to praise and sing about that today. But in First Chronicles, David said, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Say, save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us and deliver us from the nations. To give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said, Amen. Well, David had a heart for the Lord, and he believed that God would always be with him. And that's what we're going to praise the Lord about today. Please join us. Just before we do that, I just want to again say welcome, and it's good to have some actual bodies in here. Uh, I was just starting to get used to the other, so this is going to take a little getting used to again as well. So we're glad that you're here with us this morning and those of you watching at home. Uh, we hope that this all goes well. This is our first actual live stream. The, the rest was all recorded and then uh, streamed on Sunday morning, but this is the first live broadcast, so hopefully it's working out for everybody at home and uh, they'll be able to be with us the whole service. So happy Mother's Day. In case that, you know, you missed that, it's Mother's Day, so... Uh, have a great celebration of that, no matter how you may be uh, observing that today. Uh, I, I do want to give uh, some uh, thank yous for some folks over the last few weeks that have made uh, what we've been able to do possible, and without them, we would not have been able to have our uh, streaming service and, and uh, be able to meet in that way. Uh, but uh, Mark and Colton Burton, uh, John and Lene Stafford, Paul and Kaylin Howard, Megan Hune, Matt and Wendy Reed, Laura Smith, Gordon and Nancy Dilling, Mark Sinatel, and John Morphew helping us this morning out in the foyer. Uh, so without them, we couldn't have been doing what we've been doing the last few weeks. So if you see them, uh, make sure you express your thanks to them as well. Uh, now, today for communion, we're, we're going to have communion at the very end of the service uh, because uh, dismissal could be... Uh, bit of a problem if everybody starts bottlenecking. So uh, the way we're going to do this this morning is uh, communion will be at the very end of the service, and then uh, you're certainly invited to participate. If you feel like you don't want to do that this morning, that's fine as well. Uh, but if you do come up, uh, it's just like Walmart. The, the center aisles are one way this way, and then exit back out around the outside aisle. So this section, if you use this aisle, will go this way. These two aisles go this way. You can dispose of your cups uh, in the receptacles on either side as you go. And you're then dismissed. So after you take communion, just go ahead and uh, go ahead and exit. That way we'll avoid a bottleneck. Uh, if you're not going to participate in communion, just uh, meditate for as long as you'd like and, and participate in that way and then just leave when, whenever uh, you feel like you're ready to do that. All right. So uh, let's, uh, let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be together once again in this way, to be uh, together wherever we may be, because you're with us, uh, you're not bound by uh, distance, time, space, and we just praise you for that, that you're always with us, you never leave us or forsake us. We praise you this morning, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, John, and thank you again for coming to praise and worship with us today, and again, happy Mother's Day. Please rise. As we praise him for that promise that John alluded to in the prayer that God is always there, 
He will never leave us or forsake us. against me but I will hold my ground I will not fear the war I will not fear the storm my help is on the way my help is on the way oh my God he will not delay my refuge and strength surrounds me chaos abounding my soul will rest in you I will not fear the war I will not fear the storm my help is on the way my help is on the way our eyes to you, Lord. our voices to him. I lift my eyes up. My help comes from the Lord. I lift my eyes up. My help comes from the Lord. Oh my God. He is always faithful, and his promises are always true. You know, we've talked a lot about David. You've heard me talk a lot about David the past couple weeks. Um, in that last scripture that I read in Chronicles, David was actually passing the torch on to Asaph, who the Holy Spirit used in a mighty way to continue on the Psalms and the praises of Israel. And Asaph wrote in Psalm 77, verse 10 through 15, Then I said, It is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. 
Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Amen to that. Praise God. We can be sure of his goodness through the wonders of his mercy that he shows us every day. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, heavens are your tabernacle, glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our exceed, you are holy. Holy universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Let's praise him. Early in the morning, I will celebrate the light. When I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy. your majesty you are holy holy king lord of heaven and earth lord of heaven and earth sing hallelujah Beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, precious Lord. Reveal your heart to me, Father. Hold me, hold me. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy. seated. I was also glad to see that you uh, remembered to not wear your pajama bottoms to church today. So that, that was, that's good too. I uh, want you to feel relaxed, but you know, you got to draw a line somewhere. 
Now, Friday marked the 75th anniversary of the Allied victory over Nazi Germany, and, and of course, observances, despite, uh, despite the restrictions around uh, uh, the Western world, uh, ob uh, observations have been uh, held in the United States, Great Britain, uh, I think probably even Germany, I mean, all across, uh, all across Europe. Uh, Germany was occupied by the Allied powers at the end of World War II, and uh, it was divided among the, uh, the uh, conquering allies. At, at Germany, the capital of Germany, was also divided into uh, allied zones of control. And uh, Berlin was actually over here, clear in the Soviet sector, but then uh, Berlin itself was divided among the conquering powers. France, Great Britain, and the United States controlled West Berlin, while the Soviet Union controlled East Berlin. Well, by the end of the 1950s, nearly 20% of the East German population had fled to West Germany. And this shift by younger, more educated Germans led to a brain drain that affected the economic stability and the political credibility of East Germany. The main gap that allowed that movement was through Berlin. So in 1961, the Soviets began construction on the Berlin Wall which further escalated tensions during the Cold War. The symbol of the Cold War, representing that separation between East and West for the next 28 years was Checkpoint Charlie in the American sector of Berlin. Checkpoint Charlie was designated as the crossing point for all uh, foot traffic, all uh, automobile traffic for foreigners and allied forces uh, passing back and forth between West and East Berlin. Uh, anyone leaving the West or returning from the East had to pass through Checkpoint Charlie. Now, checkpoints are those official stations, those route markers that must be passed through successfully. The Apostle Peter is now halfway through his epistle, and he's already starting summations. He is bringing things together with laser-like precision. In doing so, he provides us with checkpoints through which we pass as strangers and aliens in this world as we are keeping our behavior excellent among the inhabitants of this world. Well, how do we know we're in the right place? How do we know we're on track? Checkpoints. So we're at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life, to love and, and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now the words of Peter are to all of you, whether you be citizens, employees, wives, husbands, as we looked at last week, whoever you are, wherever you may find yourselves, it's inclusive. All of you be, and then he gives his checkpoints. Checkpoints, first of all, on the internal side for thinking and feeling. And all of these, by the way, as we saw last week, require a submissive attitude. So here we go. Number one, harmonious. That word is literally same-minded. The King James has it as one mind. So unity is certainly suggested by this word. But we shouldn't confuse that kind of unity with uniformity or unanimity or even just union. It doesn't eliminate individuality or independent thought or personal preferences. This is oneness of heart and mind and purpose. We would describe it as being on the same page. I will set aside my individuality, my thoughts, my preferences for the greater good of the kingdom. Now that can only result from a strong position of submission to the Lord first and then to one another undergirded by faith. Now, to be otherwise, as James says, is to be a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. It is not a position of faith, James says, but of doubt, and is like the surf 
driven, uh, the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. A double-minded man, he says, ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Well, that's serious. This is not just about others. There is, there is personally much at stake here. Harmonious. Number two, sympathetic. Sympathes, which gives us the word sympathy. It's literally fellow feelings. It's to feel with another. It isn't to gloat or hold someone's suffering or joy against them or over them. It's to find connection and commonality in their sorrows and in their joys. It's to be similarly affected. When someone is mourning, we feel it and we mourn with them. When someone is rejoicing, we feel it and we rejoice with them. There's no scorn over their mourning. There's no jealousy over their rejoicing. It's real. It's genuine. Sympathetic. Number three, brotherly. Philadelphos. This is closely related to the word Philadelphia. Not located in Pennsylvania, but located in chapter 1, verse 22, as love of the brethren. Philadelphia. Now here, the King James has it as love as brethren. By sharing in the new birth, born again of imperishable seed, together we are now the people of God. As brethren in the same family, love as brethren. Now agape, right? Agape is another form of love, which we often encounter in the New Testament. And agape is the choice to love. It requires faith to love in an agape kind of way. Now, while agape is not completely devoid of emotions, those feelings may be present or they may not be present, at least at the beginning. Philadelphos is the kind of love that expresses itself in friendship and affection. Yes, we love by choice and by faith, agape, but we also love with friendship and affection, adelphos. And that's often expressed in the kind of fellowship we have with one another. Brotherly. Number four, kind-hearted. Now, this is a cool word. It is literally good bowels or well bowels. The bowels or the viscera were considered to be the seat of emotions. We talk about the heart. Well, just go a little lower. The viscera, that was the seat of emotions. Well, we, we retain that idea a little bit when we talk about having a gut feeling. Or if someone has an emotional outpouring, you know, they spill their guts. See, same kind of idea. It also gives new meaning to the term, you move me, baby. <laughs> Kind-heartedness, well, that's Mother's Day, guys. You can take that home and <laughs> use that at home, right? Kind-heartedness. Now, that's in contrast to hard-heartedness. It expresses a tenderness of heart toward others, no callousness. See, Jesus was often moved and motivated with this kind of compassion and tender affection, kind hearted Number five, humble in spirit, literally low-minded. It's to be lowly or bowed down in mind, humble, to defer to others or the needs of others. Jesus, the King of kings, said, I am gentle and humble in heart. Having the same attitude in yourselves, the Apostle Paul says, you are to do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Now, that's a great working definition of this kind of humility. Now, Chris and I had the other evening a bit of a dis disagreement, I guess might be the best way to describe it. She wanted me to wear a mask this morning. Now, I know this will surprise almost all of you, but I, I can be a bit stubborn at times. Now, I, I know that's maybe a shock, but it's true. And I was bound to determine not to wear a mask for a variety of reasons. I despise it. I resent it. I resist it. But in going over this point, I wore it this morning not because of what I wanted, but for you. See, that's this kind of humility that puts the needs of others, foot, uh, of others first. Following in the Lord's footsteps, we're to be humble in mind. 
Now, if you go back and meditate on each of these checkpoints, you can detect that each lays the groundwork for the next. It's like stair steps. One leads to the other. Being same-minded leads to fellow feelings, which leads to brotherly love, which leads to kind-heartedness, which leads to humble-mindedness. But these checkpoints for thinking and feeling are not the only ones on Paul's mind. Now, in verses 9 through 12, Peter contrasts the presence of, maybe it's better to talk about the conflict between evil and good in our world. And we can operate in any of three ways. We can return evil for good. Now, that's a satanic way of responding, and we see plenty of that in the world today. We can return good for good and evil for evil. That's a very human way to respond. It's a very natural way to respond. We can return good for evil. Now, that's a divine way to respond. Now, one is obvious, one is easy, and one takes hard work. It, it costs us something. It requires something of us. How can we put ourselves in a position to engage in the latter? Well, Peter, on the external side, has some checkpoints for doing and saying. Number one, verse 9. Rather than return insult for insult and evil for evil, give a blessing instead. And the reason you give a blessing rather than respond in kind to such abuse is that you have been called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. As someone blessed in Christ and to be blessed, you give blessings to others even when they do not deserve it because you did not deserve a single one of your blessings in Christ. It is an act of mercy. Now, what of Jesus? Back in chapter 2, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. You know, hitting back is what children do. This kind of restraint is the mark of maturity. When we return insult or evil, it's our effort to get back at the offender, our attempt to even the score. What does this require? It requires trust in the judge who will righteously settle all accounts. And verse 12 gives us a, a glimpse of this well-placed trust. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Here's the guarantee of righteous judgment. And we can trust the judge to settle accounts, all our accounts, far better than we ever could on our own. Number two, verse 10, keep your tongue or lips from evil. Now make no mistake about it, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You know, Peter knew the consequences of hasty speech. His mouth was constantly writing checks his flesh could not cash. Taming the wildfire of the tongue is how James might describe it. Getting the tongue under control. He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles, plural. It's guarding your soul. And this, by the way, is also on the pathway to blessing. When a prayer is uttered by such a tongue, verse 12, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. Wow. Wow. That's a blessing none of us can afford to go without. Number three, verse 11, do good. Do good. Now, your good deeds, they are not just a flash in the pan. They're not just here today, gone today. Your good deeds span the expanse of the created time-space continuum. They reach clear back to the first day of creation and extend to the last day when Jesus Christ returns. Your good deeds are your God-ordained purpose from the beginning, and these good de deeds, as they are observed by the Gentiles, will be the cause of God being glorified on the day of visitation. You see, doing good doesn't draw attention to you so much as it draws attention to your God. God receives the glory in your good works. Now, you have to proceed with a little bit of caution here. And for some of you, this may be the first time you've ever heard this. Do not confuse being good, verse 11, or doing good, verse 11, with being righteous, verse 12. 
These are very different and unrelated, at least in the way we're talking about them here. Good is what we do for God's glory. Righteousness is what we receive from God in Christ on the basis of faith. Significantly different. Doing good does not make you righteous. Doing good does not cause your stock to go up in God's eyes. Doing good is not why anyone, in fact, no one will get into heaven by doing good. The tragedy of hell is that it will be populated by good people. Only by faith in Jesus Christ will God give you. He will apply to your account the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This righteousness is what puts you in right standing with God. This righteousness, the righteousness of Christ on your account is why and is the only way you will ever get into heaven. And notice it isn't just about doing good, it's also about turning away from evil. Now we tend to think of evil as a pretty extreme term. You know, we don't typically think of ourselves, our actions, our deeds, our thoughts as evil. We know we do wrong, we know we're sinners, but evil? No, not really. I mean, we are basically good people. Well, Jesus made the passing observation that you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. See, evil often has the appearance or veneer of good, which may allow it to fly under the radar. Now, we can see evil in the world around us when it happens. We can see evil in others. But that revulsion is, is rarely applied to ourselves because we fail to see that our actions, our lives, our thoughts are truly evil in the eyes of a holy God. And until we understand that, until we see what our sins really are before God, evil, until we are overcome by a crushing sense of woe and are undone by our sins, we will not turn away from evil. And turning away isn't just dodging evil. You know, it's not just swerving out of the way. It's, it's avoiding it. It's staying completely away from it. It's having nothing to do with it. You have to think about the word repentance here. You turn from going this direction, evil, to go a completely new direction, good. And this too is itself a pathway of blessing. Repentance is one of the greatest blessings that the Lord has given to each of us. And then number four, verse 11, seek and pursue peace. Now we are right back to where we began, verse 8, harmonious. Those, in fact, who live according to verses 8 through 10 are those who seek peace and pursue it. It's impossible not to contribute to peace if you are harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, a giver of blessing, a keeper of your tongue, and a doer of good for the glory of God. The preacher in Ecclesiastes, he's the narrator of the book, he spends 12 chapters examining his life from a materialistic perspective. And, and he realizes that everything is futility and striving after wind. His reaction, so I hated my life. I hated my life. You know, everyone's been experiencing stress these days, even believers. I mean, the incidence of depression, alcohol consumption, abuse, and even suicide have gone up. We're hearing about an existential crisis in our country today. Now, why is that? Because life apart from God is futility and striving after wind. If you don't have something higher than yourself, a solid foundation, you lose your footing rather quickly when the sand starts shifting away. When everything you've known and counted on is taken away, when life is not predictable and comfortable anymore, when it, everything seems to be gone like that, where does that leave you? Well, the preacher comes down to the end of it after 12 chapters with the burden of life hanging over him, and he's left with no other conclusion than fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. Only by being in a right relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, can you find fullness and fulfillment of life. And that leads to the reaction of love of life and good days, which Peter expresses in verse 10. 
You know, some people choose to escape life. Others choose to endure life. Others still, like Peter, love life. Even though, in the not-too-distant future, he will give up his life in martyrdom for his faith in his Lord and Savior. So good days do not mean trouble-free days. But you will have purpose, meaning, direction, and hope, regardless of what those days hold. That makes them good days even in trying days like these. Checkpoints for good, day, good days, point for point. How are you doing? Where are you? Evaluate yourself. How do you score in each of these areas? What, what, what are you doing to grow in these areas? What could you be doing to grow in each area? Keep pressing on, checkpoint to checkpoint. Keep moving forward. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for uh, these words from Peter on uh, this day that uh, we can look at our lives and see how we're progressing, how we're doing, how we should be living here and now, no matter who we are, as mothers, fathers, children, wives, husbands, single individuals, men, women, whoever we may be, wherever we find ourselves in life. Father, as we follow you, we can make a difference for you as we, as we meet these checkpoints in our journey along the way. Father, we just pray that you will powerfully impact the world around us through the lives we live, through the faith we have in you. And Father, especially at this time, when, when people need to see there is a higher purpose in life, that there is a hope to be lived for, a hope to be enjoyed, a hope that gives uh, true direction and meaning to life, that we would be the ones leading the way, letting that light shine in your name. Father, bring glory to yourself in these hard times that others will find you as a result. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John, for those words of encouragement. We don't just hold these things to be true because they make us feel better. We speak them because we believe them, because they're the written word of God. And we talked at the beginning about God's promise that he will always be there, his provision through the wonders of his might, that he performs his miraculous works in the world. But the third thing was choice. The things that John spoke of on the checklist, the things that we see in the life of David, the things we see throughout the scripture, those are things that were chosen. There was a, a season in my life where I struggled very badly and very, very difficultly with the, the fact of working out your own salvation. And what I've come to realize is that it's just simply putting on Christ every day and making the choice in the midst of our circumstances to choose to believe him. His words are true, but whether they affect our lives is our choice. So as we continue to Praise Him and wrap up our service today. Please purpose in your heart, those watching at home and those here with us today, moving forward as this situation unfolds, every day we make the choice. And the choice is ours and ours alone. And we have the choice to stand on what we see and what we feel, or we can stand on the written Word of God that was given to us in love. So let's praise Him and stand in His love today. Please join us. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrows come to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken It's my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear 
doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. She no longer has a place to hide, and I am not a captive to lies. I'm not afraid leave my past behind why won't be shaken why won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm your love there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection power that can save there's power in your name When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, I'm standing in your love. I'm standing on the rock, Lord. I'm standing. Your love. Amen, Lord. We'll give you praise. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. We come to the Lord's table this morning to be reminded in the bread and the cup that the Lord Jesus Christ went through his sufferings, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead in the very act of his suffering and death for us. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And so in that suffering and death, through that suffering and death, we inherit a blessing, a blessing that we too will be glorified with him when he returns on the day of visitation. So in a moment, as you're ready, just come on up, share the emblems, and then go in peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for... uh, your son Jesus, and we just praise his glorious name this morning and and come together in that name. We just thank you, Father, that we're able to be here uh, together in person as a body, uh, perhaps together from home, uh, joined by faith to the body here, and we we just lift you up this morning. We thank you, Father, for all you've given us, the blessing you have given us through the suffering and death of your son. And Father, let that make a real difference and meaning in our lives this week as we live them for you. In Jesus' name we pray. 